Get out your wands. Today we are making homemade butter beer. Yes, today we are making butter beer. You don't even have to go to Diagon Alley to get all the stuff required to do so. I should start by saying this drink is a fermented beverage, therefore it contains alcohol. If you are under the age of 21 in the U.S., this is not the video for you. Second, there is no official recipe for butter beer for home fermentation. So this is my interpretation, my homage to the wizarding world of what butter beer would be brewed like and would taste like. And I think I came pretty close. So if you want to have a little bit of fun, please follow along. It's going to be a good time. The equipment you will need today, which can easily be gotten on Amazon or any local homebrew store, are a one gallon fermenter, sanitized, does not matter what shape, size, or variety as long as it's one gallon, a pitcher, preferably one with numbers that shows you units of measurement, but if you don't have that, you can still get pretty close. You're going to need an airlock. There's a couple different kinds. You're going to need a bung that fits your particular carboy. You're going to need a spoon and a funnel. Now, as for ingredients, I'm going to list them right. So, my idea for today was to brew a beer-like beverage. This is going to be a mixture of a braggot and a groot. A braggot is a beer, but typically also fermented with honey, so it's more of a mead. Really cool, really interesting. And then a groot is an ancient form of beer, also made with grains. Not too dissimilar from modern day beer, but instead of hops, it typically uses different herbs. So what we are going to need to do is essentially create a wort, which is an unfermented beer, and then add honey and then ferment that. You're going to need a pot, one preferably big enough to hold a gallon of water. And if that water starts to foam, be big enough that it won't overtake the sides of the pot. This stuff can foam up quite a bit, so the larger you go, the better. We're going to add our water right in. And I'm adding exactly a gallon. This is going to cook down, and then we're probably going to have to add more water to bring it back up to a gallon later on. But we're also going to have room to add honey and as much as we so choose. The next thing I'm adding is a one pound bag of five grain blend. This particular blend is whole, wheat, uh, whole grain wheat, uh, rye, barley, oats, and then triticale. Okay, cool. Nothing that hard to get. And you can use this blend if you want. This is actually just the Red Mill version. Or you can use any kind of combination of grains that you think you might like in a beer. Um, I'd say try to stick to as close to this as possible because it smells really good, and I think it's going to give us great flavor to our wort. This isn't flaked. This isn't made to pull out uh, sugars or convert starch to sugar during this process. This is only a flavoring adjunct. There will be starches in here, and we will work on converting them into fermentable sugar. But this is not the typical process for making a beer. So if that's what you're trying to look for, it's not going to be that close to this. Just giving you a heads up, but we're just going to dump the whole right inside. Now I'm going to add some spices to this that I think will accent and go very well with a sweeter uh, sweeter beer since this is going to be a butter beer and our description of butter beer as far as the books go is a very fizzy drink that's easy enough to hit that tastes like a little less sweet butterscotch. Also easy enough to uh, acquire. Everything else that goes into here is just to accent that and make it better and bring out flavors to it. Um, so I'm going to add one cinnamon stick, one star anise pod. I want to go bigger than that with either one of those because this is going to boil for about an hour and take a lot of the essence of it. I don't want this to taste like a very spiced beverage. I just want it to be a spice to it. And then I'd say roughly a teaspoon or so of allspice berries. Everything goes right in. 
And now where this is going to differ from a typical beer wort is while you're boiling the wort, you would typically add some kind of hops or a strain of hops to this in, in up to four different stages during the boil. Instead, to go back to my Groot roots, I'm going to add a little bit of thyme. I have fresh thyme here. If you can't get a hold of fresh thyme, dry will work. Just use less. And how much? I'm going to add about, I'd say a teaspoon now before boil. And then once it hits a boil, I'm going to start a timer for one hour. At the half hour point, I'm going to add the other teaspoon. That's going to mean one's going to really bitter it and bring out a lot of the oils and keep cooking it. And one's going to give it more of a earthy, florally, lighter flavor. So it's two different notes you can get from the same ingredient just by stalling. But just in like that. And now this needs to boil for at least one hour. When I say one hour, I don't mean put this on your stove, start the timer, and uh, walk away. Especially don't do that. Um, put this on your stove, give it a good stir, start the heat. When it hits a boil, start the timer for one hour. When it hits 30 minutes left, add the rest of your time, and then stir it occasionally along the way. You don't have to stir it constantly, but just every few minutes. Walk by, give it a good stir, walk away, it's fine. This doesn't have to be babysit all that much, but it will require some babysitting. I'm going to boil this and see you as soon as it's done. And like magic, we have our wort. So this boiled for an hour. Then I cooled it by putting the pot in my sink, filling it with water, just to about the level that the liquid was. Cold water, I should say. Uh, and then stirring it until it came down to temp. Uh, and right now we're looking at about maybe 117 less than I checked, which is a pitchable temperature for yeast, but still a little too hot. You want to cool it down more, but all the mixing we're about to do is probably going to cool it to that level. Uh, for this particular brew, since it's going to be pretty much all liquid, I'm going to build the rest of my wort into this pitcher, and then we're going to pour it into the fermenter. Just to make it easier on us. I should say at this point, anything that's going to touch my brew has been sanitized with a star sand solution. But you can use any food grade safe sanitizer you have access to. Um, another really just interesting fact is, I know I said we were going to boil it, but I never mentioned why we boil it or why anybody boils their warts before they ferment a beer. There's a few reasons. Now, the original reason people boiled their warts or whatever they were going to ferment with was they thought the boiling it is what made the bubbles because you see bubbles when you're boiling it and then they stay in the, the solution. We know in our current time that that's not true. But what it does do is, for one, sterilize or sanitize the ingredients because you literally boiled them for an hour, but also it extracts all of the starches, all the flavors from the grains. And if you have something that can convert from starch to sugar, it will start to in that process. However, these grains shouldn't have a lot of sugar in them to begin with. And we didn't really do anything to them prior, such as germinate or any of the other things that they do for brewing grains to allow them to extract them. But there still might be some starches or sugars in there. So before I start building this, I want to take a quick gravity reading. Now, you should have a hydrometer when you're brewing. It is a fairly inexpensive piece of equipment. And what, it, and what it does is a few different things. A, it'll tell you what your potential alcohol by volume is going to be for your brew. But also, it'll tell you what you start with so you know when you're brewing, if it's working, how fast it's working, and when it's done. Potentially. There are some factors to think about. <laughs> and we're at a 1.030, so almost nothing. Barely anything to even worry about. But you know what? If your volume goes a little bit lower than mine, if your grains are a little bit stronger than I am, tons of other factors, it could vary just slightly more or less than even that. 
and it's good to know. Next thing I want to do is add one pound of honey for today's video. The honey varietal really doesn't matter in this case. I tend to stick to wildflower or clover honeys for my meads and brackets and that kind of thing. And then if I want something more potent or different flavored, I put it into secondary. In this case, I'm going to stick with what I know and just use wildflower honey. Uh, we're going to turn our scale on. Tear it. Make sure the units are correct. And then one pound. Now, I'm adding it while it's still on the... Eh, let me just cover the cap real quick. We're adding it while it's still on the slightly warmer side because that makes it a lot easier to mix the honey into the wort. Now, I'm only adding a pound of honey today. And that's because this is a beer. It's not a wine or a mead. I'm not looking for a super strong ABV to come out of this. Really, between 6 and 8% is ideal. If it's a little lower than that, I'm fine with it. Uh, it's butter beer. It's not supposed to be something that knocks you on your butt after one glass. It's something you're supposed to be able to drink and enjoy and just have a good time with. So that's my motivation, or at least my logistics behind it. And I think that's fine. The next few things I want to add, and this is where it starts to get fun, but also weird. And around that. So I'm going to add amylase enzyme, which is going to help not only convert any starch into sugar that's in here, but also in the long run, help it clear out. Because this is a very murky liquid, um, and it will probably stay close to that if it's not aided in any way, shape, or form. It actually smells like a spiced oatmeal at the moment, which is exciting. Next thing I'm adding is a little fermato, about half a teaspoon. Because this is a yeast nutrient, it has a lot of nitrogen and other things that yeast need to do their best job. And this is a thicker brew, it just, it can use the help. Uh, I switched over recently to fermato and the results I've been seeing are fantastic. So I recommend it. And if you're going to be brewing, it's something you should look into. Just sprinkle it all on top. The next thing is going to be about a teaspoon of vanilla extract. Now, yes, I know there's a wee bit of alcohol in that. It's not going to affect anything at that volume. Uh, and you could choose to wait and add it in secondary. But I didn't want to wait. I want to add it now. And really, it's also a personal thing. I want to see if it really does carry over into secondary. And the last. And I looked for butterscotch flavor. And I couldn't find any that would come in the time I needed to make this video, but I did find a caramel and hot chocolate mix, and I read the ingredients, and for the most part, nothing in here seems like it would hurt a fermentation. I will say, it has dried milk and whey protein, which is along the lines of making a blend, which I am perfectly okay with, which will also leave a little bit of starch or sugar in here. There we go. And we're just going to add that right on top. Now, ultimately, most of that's going to fall out of suspension. But if we get a little bit of caramelly flavor out of it, I am fine. And caramelly flavor is important. Is if I just bought a store-made caramel, even if I made my own caramel, and I added it directly to this, the yeast are going to eat all of those sugars. It's fermentable. And probably not leave too much residual anything. And I need to get some source of caramelly or butterscotchy flavor into it now because when we carbonate it and everything, I can't add a fermentable sugar at that point or we're making bottle bombs. And that's not what we're here to do. We are going to mix this thoroughly through. And it smells really good at this stage. We're going to do our best to break up all the lumps.
All right, I'm just going to take a quick reading and see before that. I'm going to fill water up to the 128 ounce mark again to give me a true gallon because I'm not adding any other ingredients at this point, but I want this to be a gallon of brew in the fermenter. So let's do that. All right, and so now we should probably take a sample. Not a sample. Now we're going to take a reading. And we're at a 1.050, which is cool. If it goes completely dry at this stage, it'll be around here in potential ABV. However, in my experience, beers, groots, things in that nature, in that family, don't tend to go 100% dry because there is going to be a slight bit of unfermentable sugar in here, which is fine. Because as I said, we're just looking for around an ABV. It doesn't have to be grand in any way, shape, or form. However, now we have to get it into a fermenter, which we're going to do with... Ah. All right. Now, to get this into here, really simple. Get a funnel. All right. So now, the only real other step is going to be add your yeast. And for today, I'm adding... Uh, my normal go-to 71B, which is normally meant for a 16% or around that ABV, and is going to eat you this very quickly. I want to use Safel SO4, which is an ale yeast, which is much more appropriate for this type of brew. However, I didn't have any, and I really didn't have time to wait for it to come, and I couldn't get to a local homebrew store. So I'm using what I have, but it's a very interchangeable yeast, and at this ABV, I'm not too worried about it. We're going to pour it right on in. And I'm not even going to swirl it. I'm just going to cap it and let it go. Now, what we're going to do next is wait for about a week or two. Uh, I'm going to check it constantly. You're going to see signs of fermentation. Uh, this is probably going to froth up a lot. Give what's called a croissant line, which can be this big foamy ring around the top of it. Uh, you're going to see the pressure in the airlock change. So the water will be forced down here and come up here, and it should bubble. Those are signs of an active fermentation. But just because you don't see them doesn't mean the fermentation isn't happening. You also check the sides, see if bubbles are coming up. Uh, this should be active in some way, shape, or form. If it's not active at all, within 24 hours, you might just have dead yeast, and you might just want to add some more yeast to it. But, only time will tell. I've actually never seen it not take off within 24 hours, so I'm not the expert of it failing. However, I know it could happen, and I want to set you guys up for success. Now, that's going to sit, again, for a week or two. Once I see it settle down, I see signs of fermentation ending, I will post part two to this, which is going to be us bottling, carbonating, and then trying this brew. But I have very high hopes for my butter beer. If you like this, please hit that like button. If you have questions, comments, or concerns about anything you saw today, please leave them below. I try to answer every question I get. And if you want to see part two to the butter beer and how it turned out, hit subscribe. But that's all I have for today. I'm Phil. This is Phil with Facts. And until next time, 